إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فإن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يتع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما Brothers and sisters, pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may Allah give us sincerity to speak the truth in the light of the Qur'an and the sunnah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to understand them, to accept them in the heart and to implement them in our life. Today, regarding the fiqh of Friday, we will be dealing inshallah four serious issues related to the person entering the masjid. That is an etiquette of a Muslim while entering uh, the masjid for Friday prayer. So far what we have covered, we have in the first khutbah we were dealing about the virtues and merits of attending the Jummah khutbah and the punishment and the curse of those who are not attending. And the second we did about the ruling of uh, khutbah, uh, Friday prayer, who are exempt from the Friday prayer. And the third we were dealing about the preparation from home to coming to the masjid on Friday. Now today, inshallah, we are going into the masjid on Friday. So there are four issues which we have to deal with, inshallah. When a person goes to the masjid on Friday, he has to take care of certain serious issues to get the complete reward of uh, the Friday prayer, which Rasul has said, it is an expiation of the sins between two Jummahs. So if a person has attended and he has maintained the discipline and responsibility according to the uh, Quran and Sunnah, then he is promised of the reward that he, his sins between two Jummahs will be forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is mentioned specifically that these are minor sins, not the major sins. So now we are assuming that we are in the masjid. So when we go into the masjid, we have to go with the right hand, uh, right leg, in the, we have to step in with our right foot in the masjid. And we have to make this dua, and this dua is also very, very authentic and it should be read by all the Muslims 
when they enter the masjid. And if, even if you come to this place because we are the praying here, so you can make this dua from here or the door that you enter there. So it can be Alhamdulillah. And the dua is that Rasulullah used to say Bismillah wa salamu ala Rasulillah Allahumma ghfirli dhunubi wa ftahli abu abu rahmatik Bismillah in the name of Allah wa salamu ala Rasulullah and peace be upon the messenger of Allah Allahumma ghfirli dhunubi Allah forgive my sins wa ftahli abu abu rahmatik Allah open the doors of mercy for me your doors of mercy open them for me so this is Alhamdulillah, this, with this intention, when a person enters the masjid, he should say this because he is entering into the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the intention that Allah will forgive his sins and he is asking Allah to open the doors of mercy. This is the dalil and everything, inshallah, you will get it on the internet, on the website, inshallah. Second point, when a person is inside the masjid now, now in this, mashallah, in our center here, we don't find that kind of a problem. But in uh, the, where the places, where the uh, regular prayers are offered and the Jummah is prayed, people do make a very serious mistake, which Rasulullah has seriously warned us, that separating two men sitting together while they are listening to the khutbah. And this is haram in Islam. For an example, you entered the masjid and you want to sit some in a particular place and you are separating two Muslim brothers they are sitting together, you are separating them and you are sitting in between them this is not permissible in uh, in the masjid and this is what Rasulullah has said it has been reported by Salman that Rasulullah has said when a person goes to Juma prayer and without separating two men sitting together in the mosque he gets the reward. So that means it is haram. And I'll get you the ahadith where you will find that Prophet ﷺ strictly warned a man who was doing this kind of a thing and he stopped his khutbah and said, sit down, you are hurting others. So this is the second issue that when you come to the masjid, you sit wherever you get a place, but if you have the intention to sit in front of the imam, then you have to come first and there is no way that you think, okay, your friend is sitting there, so, and he is sitting with the next person, so you go into them and you separate them and you sit in between them, that is not permissible in Islam. This is in Sahih Bukhari. Number three, it is haram to make another get up and then sit in his place. This is what most of the time in the masajid where the trustees are, you know, ruling, the Chaudhrys and uh, leaders, they, they are saying that they have a specific place. If by mistake somebody has sat on that place, then the trustee will come or the chamcha will come, the chamcha of that to masjid will come and will ask him to get up from there because this is ye Chaudhry sahab ki jagah. Who is Chaudhry in the masjid? Who is Chaudhry? Who is Peer sahab? Who is Wali sahab? Inna akramakum indallahi atqakum. The most pious in the sight of Allah, the most honored in the sight of Allah is the most pious person. Chaudhri sahab may be smoking outside the masjid, maybe he's cursed by Allah and the person who is sitting there, he said by mistake, okay, maybe he, with the respect of Chaudhri sahab, no problem, he can have a space for the Chaudhri sahab. But this is what I'm saying here, that Rasul sallam said that it is haram that you make somebody get up from his place and you occupy his place. You occupy his place or you occupy his place for someone else? And this is very commonly practiced. And subhanAllah, this is also happening in uh, Arab world. But alhamdulillah, I never let that happen in my masjid. If the masjid owner, the person who is the trustee or the one who sponsors the masjid, if he comes on time and he gets the place, he gets the place there. But if he comes into my masjid and I'm a khatib or imam there, and he wants somebody else to get up from that place and he wants to sit there, I will never let that happen. And I did that, alhamdulillah. I have been, you know, taken for many cases and all that. I said, no problem. Prove it to me that even the time when Rasulullah ﷺ was late, subhanAllah, this is a hadith in Sahih Bukhari, he was late once. He was late. 
And it was the time for the prayer. A Sahabi stood and he started praying. And when Rasulullah came to join the Jamaat, he was busy with, you know, making wudu, so he was late. And the Sahaba were whispering, Rasul has come. And this Imam who was leading the prayer, he wants to come back. So that the Prophet can, and Prophet made him continue with his prayer. So if this is the case with Rasul Sallallahu is there anybody greater than Rasul Sallallahu Is there anybody who is more honorable than Rasul Sallallahu No. Alhamdulillah. And for me it was easy to convince Arabs because I was talking from Quran and Sunnah. But to convince these people you are just you know, hitting your head to the rock. They don't understand Quran and Sunnah. Instead of that they will say, Tumara deen hi alag hai. Your religion is different. So they will not take Quran, but for me, alhamdulillah, in Dubai it was not that hard to convince or to argue with the Arabs because my whole argument was based on Quran and Sunnah. So this is the issue which we have to understand and this is reported by Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anh, where Prophet Sassam has said, no person should ask another person to stand up from his place and then sit there himself, but he should simply say, make some room for me. Make some room, please, make some room for me. And this is, uh, when Prophet ﷺ has said this, means the scholars have agreed, there is no second opinion, that it is haram. That you make somebody, like some gangster will come, okay, this is our place. Get up! You are a poor guy. Subhanallah, I, I want to see these kind of gangsters. <laughs> okay, alhamdulillah. Let's go to the next topic. The fourth issue in this is, yeah, the fourth issue, sometimes when we come to the masjid and we want to sit, you know, we must have heard somebody saying, you know, sitting close to the imam, you get more reward. You came late, you enjoyed your dunya, and now you came late, and now you also want to have the same reward, and you are, you know, jumping over step, you know, cover, stepping over the shoulders of the people. This is what Rasul has said that it is haram to jump over the shoulders of others in the mosque and to come in front. And this is found in Sunan ibn Majah and also in Sunan Abu Dawud where Rasulullah said it is haram. It is haram and he, one sahabi, was doing that. He said, stop, you are hurting people, sit wherever you get the place. He discontinued his khutbah. So this is not allowed. Alhamdulillah, in this masjid it's okay, we have enough space. May Allah reward Harun Bhai. No, no problem, we can easily accommodate our people here. But you know, it is happening in some massages where people are jumping over the shoulders and trying to get the place near the Imam and this is not allowed. So in this first thing that we have to understand, when you enter the masjid, you should enter with the dua. Your right foot should be in the masjid. You have to make the dua. Then when you enter the masjid, wherever you get the place, you can sit. You should not separate two people and sit in between them. Third, you should not make the person get up from his place and you occupy his place. And the fourth is stepping over their shoulders and jumping and crossing them and sitting in front is also haram. Now the second issue. Second issue is after maintaining this discipline, what you have to do is you have to get yourself occupied with the worship. And that is regarding the prayers. How many sunnah rakat can be offered before Juma? And what is the maximum and what is the minimum? And what is the ruling of this prayer in this center here? Because this is not what we are learning here. This center is a center. It's not regularly known as masjid. So these rulings are about the masjid and center because a place where you can offer any salah, that place also is understood as masjid, except Qabristan, which is a graveyard, toilet, and the places which are where the place near the, uh, where the, like temple and synagogue or something like that, where the idol worship is taking place, there in that place you are not allowed to worship. Otherwise, Hadith in Sahih Bukhari says, all the land, every part of the earth is masjid for us, except the toilet or bathroom or graveyard or where the idol worshipping is taking place or where the animals 
wild animals or like camels are tied where your life is in danger they, these are the places where you are not allowed to pray otherwise you can pray anywhere so here this center when we are praying over here this is not a kabrastan alhamdulillah all people are alive this is not a kabrastan this is not a toilet much less a clean place alhamdulillah there is no idol worshipping taking place here so we can conduct our juma prayer here so here if we apply the ruling of the sunnah before Juma prayer, what are the Sunnah before Juma prayer? We will learn from here. Issue number one, that Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, a Muslim must sit, must not sit in the mosque. This is the mosque or even in this place, if, you, if it is, if you consider this place before sitting, he must not sit before offering minimum, minimum two rakats. And it is a consensus of all the scholars that there is no fixed number of rakat for the Juma prayer before the Juma prayer. For the Juma, before the Juma prayer. There is no fixed number of rakat. When you enter the masjid and you have like one hour, you enter the masjid before Imam starting his khutbah before an hour, you can pray. Two rakat, you can pray four rakat, you can pray six rakat, you can pray eight rakat, you can pray ten rakat, you can pray, but minimum two, because that is called as Sahiyatul Masjid. Sahiyatul Masjid is a greeting to the Masjid, and this Sahiyatul Masjid is so serious that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he was delivering a khutbah and a man entered the mosque. He stopped his khutbah and he said, did you pray your two rakat? He said, no, you were giving, giving the khutbah, so I said. So now some people today, they take this as a hadith. They say, look, sahabi sat down because khutbah is more important than that. Okay, we know khutbah is a pillar of the prayer. But at the same time, we have to understand the guidance and teaching of Rasulullah He made him get up and he said, إِذَا دَخَلَ أَحَدُكُمُ الْمَسْجِدَةِ وَالْإِمَامُ يَخْطُبُ فَلَا يَجْلِسْ حَتَّى يَرْكَعَ رَكَعَتَيْنِ Hadith in Sahih Muslim and different books of Hadith where Rasulullah has said when anybody enters the masjid and Imam is delivering the khutbah then you should not sit before praying to short rakat. The word is in Arabic, short rakat is mentioned. That means it's not like you started your Allahu Akbar and you want to read Surah Al-Baqarah in that. Surah Al-Baqarah is two, two and a half Jews, 286 verses, it will take minimum if you read normally, it will take two and a half hours for you to complete Surah Al-Baqarah, which is maybe, you know, two times, more than two times than the khutbah timing. So definitely, I'll go home, I'll come back for my Arabic classes and still your Salat will not be over. So you, when you pray, when you pray two rakat, these two rakat should be short, two rakat. And this is considered for all the places where the prayers are taken place. So this is the first issue and the, that when you enter the masjid you should not sit before offering two rakats. So this is the minimum and there is no maximum limit to that. You can pray as much as you want but if you see all around the masajid what they have they have a system that people, they go to the Juma Masjid, Juma prayer, they listen to the Molusar's bayan. And then after the bayan, they will, there will be a person who will give the adhan. And then after the adhan, the people will be given some time to pray some sunnah prayer. And then the Imam Sahib will deliver the khutbah of Juma. And then they, they, they start their prayers. This is nowhere from the Quran and the Sunnah. And now you will be saying, oh, come on, man. If that is not there from Quran and Sunnah, the, how the whole world, 75% of the whole world, they do that. Okay, that's fine. 75%, you can say even 100% of the people are doing something which is not from the Quran and Sunnah, that will not make it from Quran and Sunnah. Quran and Sunnah is Islam. Yes or no? Quran and Sunnah is the one that is given to us by Allah and His Messenger. Yes or no? So if the people, they don't follow, it won't change the Sharia. 
And if the people, they follow something different than that, that also cannot be part of Sharia because that is not Islam. Islam is what is given to us in the Quran and the Sunnah of Rasulullah And that is why Allah SWT has asked us to declare the Shahada. When we declare the Shahada, we say, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. That I bear witness that Allah is the only authority to be worshipped, no one else. And I also bear witness that Muhammad Sallallahu is not only the human being. Muhammad Sallallahu is not only a Nabi. Muhammad Sallallahu is a messenger of Allah. When you say messenger of Allah, that means you have to accept his message. When you accept him as a Rasul, you have to accept his message also as a Rasul. So his message is Islam. And in his message, I can tell you my brothers and sisters, you can go and ask any Mulvi Sahib, that the bayan that they give before the Juma prayer, where, that, where is it mentioned? Nowhere. And people sitting like that, listening to the bayan in the masjid, they don't care for the Tahiyatul Masjid, and they just listen to the Mulvi Sahib's bayan, and after the bayan, the adhan is given, and then after the adhan, the khutbah is given, the people they pray the sunnahs. This is not from the Quran and Sunnah. Hadith, you can go back to the reference. If you have Sahih Muslim in your house, check it. Sahih Muslim, Salatul Jum'ah. Sahabi's name is Jabir radiallahu anhu. And he is saying that Rasulullah used to enter the masjid. He would ascend the mimbar. Enter the masjid, he would ascend the mimbar, he would face the audience and he would say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Then he would sit. Then the adhan will be delivered. These are the exact words. And inshallah, if you want, you can refer to my website, you will get all the dalil for that. These are the exact, exact words of the Sahabi. That Rasulullah would enter the masjid, ascend the mimbar, pulpit, Facing the audience, he would greet them with salam and he would sit. And Bilal would give the adhan. And after that, he would start giving the khutbah. And he, the sahab is saying the khutbah is of two types, uh, two parts. First part, he would praise Allah, send the ruh upon himself, he will quote the ayat from the Quran, and then he would sit for a while. Get up again, praising Allah, praising, sending durud upon himself, and would conclude the first part of the khutbah. So this is the system of Rasul Sallallahu Nowhere, nowhere in the hadith that Rasul Sallallahu used to come to the masjid, he would just give the bayan, and then the adhan is delivered, then people will pray sunnah, and then he will give the juma khutbah, and that will be totally in Arabic. No, nothing like that. And the word khutbah. The word khutbah means speech. Speech. And khitab is addressing the people. And in Arabic, when you give khutbah or a speech and you are giving the khitab to the people, and if they don't understand your language, that means you have not given, you have not fulfilled the rights of the khutbah. And this is a big issue today in India and Pakistan, that the khutbah must be in Arabic. Khutbah must be in Arabic. And if it is done in other language, the Juma is not valid. Subhanallah. But they also pinpoint to us, they say these people are talking directly the whole Khutbah in English. Now, all of you, mashallah, since two years you people are coming over here. You can see the first khutbah, part of my Khutbah. At least seven minutes, I give the Khutbah from Arabic word. Yes or no? I quote all the verses, I quote all the uh, statements which are found from the Quran and the Hadith of Rasul and that is the part of his Khutbatul Haja. And I read that first. Then I read the topic which I want to discuss with you. And even in that you know all the time, that's my always the routine, that always I bring the ayat and the Hadith and I read it to you. Sometimes I skip the text because of the situation of the time. Otherwise, I always read the ayat and a hadith. But if I give you the khutbah in the language which you don't understand, then there is no, the purpose of the khutbah is dead. It's not served. And only Rasul Sallallahu was the only messenger of Allah who spoke Arabic. 124,000 prophets and messengers of Allah, they were not speaking Arabic. But they were messengers and prophets of Allah. 
And they were the prophets and messengers of Allah. They brought the message to the people in the language of the people that they understood. That they have understood. And Allah has said the differences of the languages is one of the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's existence. You see Chinese, how they speak Chinese. And there are Muslims who speak Chinese. You go to Brazil, there are Muslims who are speaking their native language and they are Muslims. So, coming back to this point, that khutbah can be given in any language that people can understand because the word khutbah means is the speech and it should be given to the audience in the language that they understand. During the time of Rasulullah they didn't have madrasas. During the time of Rasulullah they didn't have universities and schools and colleges. All the issue of Islam, right from the birth of the child, from the cradle to the death, grave, Everything was taught by Rasulullah in the Jummah Khutbah. So if we want to follow the Sunnah of Rasulullah and we want the good for the people, if we are well wisher for the Ummah, then we have to utilize at least this time, Jummah, to teach the Ummah. And if I want to teach you Islam right from the time, everybody, want, all of us need Islam to be taught. And if we learn Islam, then we have to learn the Islam from the time we are born till we die. And this is, this can only be done in this discipline with, mashallah, with concentration only in Juma. And if that too is done in a language that people don't understand, then it's a waste of time. You cannot expect the same audience to come for Saturday course. You cannot expect the same people to come on other days. So this is a great opportunity where people can come together, mashallah, in this huge Audience is a huge, great number where you can teach Islam to them. And that is why it is agreed by all the scholars that the khutbah can be given in other language, in the language the people understand, with this condition that the ayat and ahadith must be quoted in Arabic. Because Arabic is also part of khutbah. So coming back to our point. The second issue is, that how many sunnah are we allowed to pray before the Juma prayer? As I said, there is no fixed number. You can pray two, you can pray four, you can pray six, you can pray eight, you can pray ten, you can pray twenty. You can pray the whole tarawih twenty rakat, two please Hanafis, no problem. Make them happy at least for one day. No problem. So you can pray twenty rakat. But the minimum that you can pray is Two rakat because Rasul has said, إِذَا دَخَلَ أَحَدُكُمُ الْمَسْجِدَ وَالْإِمَامُ يَخْطُبُ فَلَا يَجْلِسْ حَتَّى يَرْكَعَ رَكَعَتَيْنِ When a person enters the masjid and imam is delivering the khutbah, you should not sit before offering minimum two rakat. And that is not for the khutbah, but that is for the tahiyyatul masjid that you have to. But after that, after two rakat, when the imam is delivering the khutbah, some of the brothers I know, that they think, no, it is must, and we have to pray two rakat, and two rakat, sunnah, two rakat, nafil, four rakat, sunnah, so like that they go, they are, you know, mis, uh, you know, the misunderstanding of them is, they compare the sunnah of Zohar with the sunnah of Juma. Sunnah of Zohar are, yes, hadith in Sahih Bukhari, quoted by Aisha, quoted by Abdullah bin Umar, hadith in Sahih Bukhari, Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu ta'ala, she saying, that the sunnah before Zohar prayer are two sunnah rakat, which is a regular sunnah. Abdullah bin Umar is saying four rakat. So the scholars they say, Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu ta'ala anha, she once she saw Rasulullah sallam, she saw him praying two rakat. Abdullah bin Umar saw him praying four rakat. So as Muslim, because the one who is praying is Rasulullah sallam, so he prayed sometimes, two sometimes, Four. So we can take to our ease. Whatever is convenient for us, we can pray two or we can pray four. And these are regular sunnahs before the Zohar prayer. But there is no hadith. There is no authentic hadith. Take my word, I'm saying you. There is no authentic hadith. That, that these are the number of rakat that you have to pray before Zohar, uh, Juma prayer. 
So, when there is no specific hadith, that means we don't have to pray. No, I said, you can pray, you can pray two, you can pray four, you can pray six, you can pray eight, you can pray ten. Minimum you can pray two because it will be counted as sunnah as well as it will be counted as tahiyatul masjid. Second issue is that the khutbah can be given in the language that people understand. With the condition that it should be not the bayan, bayan is not part of the khutbah, it should be the same way Imam must enter the masjid, face the audience, greet them with salam, adhan is delivered, he reads the ayat, praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, quotes the ayat and ahadith, explain it to them, have a pause, get up again, praise Allah, and then conclude the talk, and then he can come back and lead the prayer. This is the sunnah and that you can also do. It's not necessary you have to be alim, alim allama, PhD holder, degree holder, you should be half. No, these are the simple ways. Come to the masjid, ascend the member, greet them with salam, let the adhan be delivered, then get up, praise Allah. We can praise Allah in our language, in a simple way. Quote the ayah, any ayah that you know. Quote any hadith that you know. And you can explain on that, give the explanation, and then have a pause. Get up again, then do the same thing, conclude the khutbah, make dua for the Muslims in general, send the rood upon Rasulullah and then you can be the Imam, you can lead the prayer. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah wa lakum. Inna alhamdulillah, nahmadu wa nusalli ala rasulihi al-kareem, amma ba'd. Now after that, there is a third issue which is again very very important and this is regarding the manners while listening to the khutbah of Imam the manners and etiquette and adab and akhlaq of a Muslim who is listening to the khutbah of Imam five issues are mentioned in the ahadith issue number one a person must try his level best to come and sit close to the Imam Issue number two, he must listen to the khutbah without uttering a single word with the person sitting next to him. Number three, the manner of sitting while listening to the khutbah. Number four, if a person feels tired, drowsy, sleepy, okay, then he must change his place or he must wash his face and come back. Then the fifth one is that he must continue in the same situation till the Imam finishes his prayer. It's not like you had attended the khutbah of Imam Sahib and Imam Sahib said something that doesn't, you know, that goes against your understanding. You say, Chala Bhagja, we don't want to pray. Like the brothers Muhajirun, they did. MashaAllah. May Allah reward them. They left. So they didn't want to pray. So this is, these are the five Discipline we have to mention. Number one, that we have to come and sit close to the Imam. Number two, we have to listen to the khutbah. We are not allowed to even utter a single word sitting with the, you know, with the person sitting next to us. Number three, the same pose, the stance, the posture, the system, the way, the way we sit in the Juma khutbah, how to sit properly. And number four, is when a person feels tired or drowsy or sleepy then he must change his place or must wash himself number five is that he must complete after this he must complete the salah also with the imam this is the five issues related now the fourth issue which is about the prayer with the imam and that is very very detailed khutbah which alhamdulillah I deliberately kept it for the next Juma, in which we will be dealing with the issue of how to stand in the row with the Imam, where to fold the hands, what to recite, if, if you have to recite Surat Al-Fatiha, what is the ruling for that, if you have to say Amin, what is the ruling of that, if you have to raise the Rafael Yedin, if you have to do that, what is the ruling for that, all those issues which are controversial issues which you find in the different mosques, 
and based on these controversial issues people are divided into groups people they curse each other people they write books with volumes refuting each other and these issues were not that serious if we say okay alhamdulillah this is what i'm doing is from quran and sunnah if somebody does not do that then he is answerable to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that will be the end of the story no fighting nothing because allah is the one who will judge us and if we come to that understanding and we become that matured where we respect somebody what he is doing okay that's his choice his will and what you are doing you are following quran and sunnah you can only convey that to the others but you cannot force and you cannot fight and you cannot divide yourself because of based on that issue so this issue the fourth issue is the manners and the description of the prayer with the imam the whole description starting from allahu akbar till the salam that will be inshallah in next juma and the juma starts at 1 o'clock my brothers you have to remember that juma starts at 1 o'clock so you have to be on time so now these five issues let's take the dalil number 1 sitting close to the imam rasul sallallahu has said and this is from samura bin jundab radhiyallahu an be present at the mention of allah and go near the imam this is what rasul sallallahu is saying for if anyone always keeps far away yeah the people they want to sit behind you know like in the normal masjid people will come and just just they sit like this enjoy subhanallah physically he is in the masjid physically he is in the masjid but mentally he is elsewhere so that is not if you do that and you want to keep away from the molvi sahab even in the street when you see molvi sahab you change the route abhi kuch na kuch bol dega he will say something now so if you do that see what the hadith is applicable everywhere it says be present at the mention of allah and go near the imam for it for if anyone always keeps away from uh, away the result will be that he will be put in a back place in paradise so in the paradise we will have the same gathering brothers will be sitting mashallah and ibrahim alayhi salam will be empire for the cricket for you know fours and six so we will be sitting all together but the one who will be keeping himself away from this islamic gathering in the dunya he will be put back the same way in the jannah also so this is the encouragement that a person must come you know close to the imam but don't do that okay because otherwise everybody will fight and then i have to squeeze myself into the wall then okay but try your best alhamdulillah you are still close to me the second issue rasul sallam he saw somebody was correcting someone in the juma two people were there one was misbehaving that that person who saw him doing that he said something to him what did rasul sallam do he said to the one who was correcting that you have destroyed the reward of your own khutbah so what we learn from this hadith that if you find that somebody is doing something wrong in the juma you wait have sabr no have sabr once the juma is finished you can advise me so that i can issue raise that issue the next juma and correct people generally so the person personally will not be embarrassed or you can take him in a corner and just tell him brother this is the against the teaching of rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam but while listening to the khutbah correcting somebody that is not permissible that's only permissible for whom for the imam imam can stop his khutbah he can ask the person he can ask the audience they have to respond to it and there are so many ahadith to that rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam did stop his khutbah not only that this hadith in sahih bukhari he came down He came down from the khutbah member. He took a person in the corner and he started explaining to him. And yet people are waiting for him to finish the juma. So that is in the juma. So that can be done only when the imam is doing that, but not for other people. Alhamdulillah, as far as you people are sitting together, you should not. Now, in juma khutbah, we are not allowed to sit like this. In juma khutbah, we are not allowed to sit like this. 
अरे ओके देख लो कोई मसला नहीं है भाई स्टैंड अप एंड सीट इन जुमा खुद बार वी आर नॉट अलाउड टू सीट लाइक दिस इन जुमा खुद बार वी आर नॉट अलाउड टू सीट लाइक दिस एंड आल्सो वी आर नॉट अलाउड टू सीट लाइक दिस दिस इज व्हाट द रसूल सल्लल्लाहु अलैहि वसल्लम इज एक्सप्लेन दिस इज कॉल्ड इहतिबा इहतिबा इज हराम इन इस्लाम मींस आदर यू सीट लाइक दिस or you put your hands like the dogs they do they they spread the legs out and they do like this these things are not allowed you can sit in a normal way fold your legs the way you fold for the tashahhud you can sit that way you can fold your legs in front of you like the when you do yoga you can sit that way that's also allowed but not the way the like the dogs are sitting so and this way so this is how and this you you can see in the zoo or any animal documentary you will see sometimes dogs when they are in a emotional mood they just spread their legs and die. so we, we are not allowed to do that while we are attending the juma khutba so this is the uh, uh, for, for third issue fourth issue is that rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam told us to change our place when somebody is drowsy or tired and he should be because the khutba is important he must listen to it Fourth one is the Rasul صلى الله عليه وسلم said, the one who completes his prayer with the Imam, he gets the complete reward of that. So you finish the Juma khutba, the khutba is attended, then the Imam starts with the prayer, you start with him and you end with him. Inshallah, you get the reward. So these are the uh, three issues of today's khutba. While entering the masjid, how you enter the masjid. maintain the discipline not to separate the people not to make somebody get up from his place and also uh, not to step over the shoulders of the people and the third issue is this that you sit and listen to imam khutba sit close to him don't talk with others and sit in a proper manner and if you feel tired refresh yourself and then complete the prayer with the imam inshallah make sure next juma take tea if you want before you come if you think you want to be fresh take coffee if you want but come with fresh mind because there are so many things which you will learn about your own salah from the sunnah which you people are not aware of the way you people are praying alhamdulillah allah will accept it but after knowing this sunnah which is again the, these notes will be already there before the juma khutba you can take them from the uh, website but be fresh when you come next juma because this is the way when we are standing in front of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we should pray as rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam had said sallu kama ra'aytumuni usalli pray as you see me praying so that way when we are praying we are praying for allah so we should be according to the teaching of our rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam because he practically showed us how to pray so we have to maintain our discipline in the prayer so that will be taught in detail inshallah in the next juma allahumma salli ala muhammad wa ala ali muhammad kama sallaita ala ibrahim wa ala ali ibrahim innaka hamidum majid allahumma barik ala muhammad wa ala ali muhammad kama barakta ala ibrahim wa ala ali ibrahim innaka hamidum majid wa aqim as-salah rashid kif da iqama ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له 
واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد فان خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما brothers and sisters pray to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may allah give us sincerity to speak the truth in the light of the quran and the sunnah of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam to understand them to accept them in our heart and to implement them in our life today inshallah i'll be de- dealing with three main subject related to juma number one who are exempted from juma means those people upon whom the juma prayer friday prayer is not obligatory second what are the genuine reasons by which people can leave juma prayer and pray zohar prayer and the third issue those people who are not attending juma prayer regularly what is the warning against these people and uh, last juma khutbah alhamdulillah i have already forwarded to the brothers who have sent me the emails i have sent the notes to them and also i have sent the links of my khutbah so they if they want to listen to my khutbah what i have said about juma khutbah last juma they can listen to that and also they can print out the notes if they want so those brothers who have sent me the emails i have forwarded them the audio of this last juma as well as the notes of the last juma even today if you send me the email inshallah then definitely i will send you the uh, link of this khutbah as well as the notes inshallah issue number 1 there are two types of people one is those upon whom the juma is obligatory and there are the second type of people are those who can be exempted from juma khutbah so if we take those people first that those who are exempted from the juma khutbah then it is understood that other the other party is the one who have to attend the juma khutbah number 1 the young child who has not yet reached the age of puberty the baligh the child who has not reached the age of bulugha that child is exempted it is not compulsory upon him but if he attends the juma khutbah and if he attends the juma khutbah with his own intention then he will be rewarded otherwise if he he has been brought or she has been brought by the parents then inshallah the parents will get the reward for that and the dalil for that is the hadith of hajj that a lady came to rasul sallam while he was performing the hajj she raised the child and she said that is this hajj obligatory upon this child the prophet sallam has said no but the reward of the hajj for this child will be for the parent so that means whatever the child who has performed the hajj uh, before the age of puberty before the bulugha then the reward is given to the parent so same thing if a child who has not reached the age of puberty then there is no juma compulsory upon that child but if the parent mother or father bring the child to the juma khutbah then inshallah the child khutbah is accepted also the parents will get the reward for that this is first issue second is the woman all those women whether whether they have reached the age of puberty or they are under the age of puberty juma khutbah juma namaz now juma prayer is not compulsory upon them it is not compulsory upon them and if they want to attend the juma khutbah then we should not stop them 
Like Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said different ahadith you can inshallah when you will email me the details uh, then I will send you the notes inshallah. If you send me your email then I will send you the notes so you will get the dalil in that. That Rasulullah sallallahu has said O slaves of Allah do not stop do not prevent your women to, uh, from coming to the masjid. So if they want to come to the masjid let them come. So this is the hadith of Rasulullah which is applicable for all, means all the prayers can be uh, five daily prayers as well as the Juma prayer. But for the women, Juma prayer is not compulsory. If they want to attend, they can come and attend the Juma prayer and inshallah they will get the rewards. Then they don't have to pray Zohar. But if they are not attending the Juma prayer, then they can still stay at home and they can pray their Zohar. Zohar is for the them. But there is another thing which I have to bring to your notice that in Luton there is a sister's halqa, halaqa. I don't know where it is but it is in Luton that there are some sisters they conduct the study circle on Juma at the time of Juma prayer. And many women they go there to attend that halaqa. This is not permissible in Islam. This is not permissible in Islam. Women can have their study circle. Women can have their halaqa. But not at the time of Juma prayer. And elsewhere than their house. Means if the women they have any study circle in their house. Of the same women of the same house. Then they can have it. Because Juma is not compulsory upon them. But especially if they have a steady circle somewhere else at the time of Juma and the women are going to that place then for them it is compulsory to come for the Juma then because that steady circle is not compulsory compared to Juma prayer so if the Juma prayer is attend, if they can attend that halaqa then they must attend the Juma but that is also not compulsory for them and this is also not compulsory but the issue is not that issue is that they should not conduct that study circle at the time of Juma prayer for the women with this intention that Juma is not fall upon women so they won't go for the Juma but they can come for the study circle. No, that is not permissible in Islam. Because that is that the for, for this to attend the Juma khutbah, to pray Juma khutbah, to learn Islam. And if they want to learn Islam at that time elsewhere in the study circle, then that is not obligatory whereas this is something which is prescribed by Allah in the Quran and which is prescribed by Rasulullah by in his tradition, in his last time. So if the women they want to come for the Juma, they can come. But if they don't want to come then that's also choice but they can pray their Zohar at home. At the same time, at the Juma time they are not allowed to go elsewhere for shopping or for study circle especially at the time of Juma. This is second issue. The third one is a person who is a slave, a Muslim slave. A Muslim slave, it is Zohar is fard upon him, but Juma is not compulsory upon him. If he wants to come for the Juma prayer, then he has to take, it is must that he must take the permission of his master. The owner of that slave must give him the permission for the Juma prayer, otherwise it is not compulsory upon him. I repeat, the child who is under the age of puberty, the woman, who, uh, Muslim women, and the slave, these are the people upon whom the Juma is not compulsory. If the slave wants to attend the Juma khutbah, then he must take the permission of his master. The fourth one is a traveler. The fourth person is a traveler. Prophet sallallahu alaihi has said in the hadith that traveler is exempted from Juma. He can pray his Zohar two rakat. Shorten the prayer. Uh, Zohar can be offered. So the person who has, you know, lived his, he has uh, left his house and he is traveling from one place to another place and he has come to a place where the Juma is conducted then he can attend the Juma if he wants. Juma will be accepted, but it is not compulsory upon him. He can leave the Juma because he is a traveler. The fifth person is the one who is sick, ill. 
men or a woman who is unable to come because of the physical health. So this person is exempted from attending the Jummah, but he can pray his Zohar prayer at home. So these are the five people who are mentioned in the Quran, in the Hadith by Rasulullah that there are five people upon whom the Jummah khutbah, a Jummah prayer is not compulsory. One is the child who has not reached the age of puberty. Number two, the woman. Number three, the traveler. Number four, the slave. And number five, the one who is sick. So these are the people, if they deliberately leave the Jummah and they don't attend the Jummah, then it is, there is no sin upon them, there is no punishment for them. They are exempted, but they have to pray Zohar prayer wherever they are. أَقُولُ قَلِ هَذَا وَالصَّفْرُ اللَّهِ وَلَكُمْ إِنَّ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ نَحْمَدُ وَنُصَلِي عَلَى رَسُولِهِ الْكَرِيمِ أَمَا بَعْدْ Now there are two more issues that we have to understand. So, if we, if we are not people under the age, under the puberty, if we are not women, if we are not slaves, if we are not travelers, and if we are not ill, then it is compulsory for us to attend the Jummah. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa has said in Sahih Muslim, that people must stop, people must stop missing the Jummah prayers, otherwise, if they keep on missing the Jummah prayers, three consecutive Jummah prayers, then there will be a time where Allah SWT will seal their heart, Allah will seal their heart and they will become heedless, they will become maghafileen. So this is the punishment for those people who are deliberately missing the Jummah prayers, not attending the Jummah prayers. And Rasul has said that if you miss three Jummahs continuously, then your heart will be sealed by Allah. Your heart will be sealed by Allah and then you will be counted, you will be listed in the uh, list of the ghafileen. Ghafileen are those who are, Allah SWT has left them. They are heedless, they are careless people. So this is the serious punishment for that. Another hadith of Rasulullah which is again in Musnad Imam Ahmed, where Rasulullah has said that I wish I wish that somebody gives the adhan of the Jummah, somebody gives the khutbah and lead the prayer and I will go out of the masjid and I will burn the houses of those people who will, who are not attending the Jummah prayer without any genuine reason. I repeat again, this is not the confusion because there is another hadith where it says that I want to burn the houses of those people who do not attend congregational prayer, Jamaat. That is five daily prayers. The people are not attending masjid while they are praying Fajr at home. They are not attending Zohar in the masjid. They are not attending Asr in the masjid. They are not attending Maghrib in the masjid. They are not attending Isha in the masjid. So Prophet said, I want to burn their houses and I will let somebody pray in my place and I will go out and burn the houses. But that hadith is for the five congregational prayers. And this hadith which I am quoting, this is from Muslim Imam Ahmed. Where specifically Rasulullah has said, I want to burn the houses of those people who are not attending the Jummah prayer for any, without any reason. So these two ahadith, the first one, that if a person misses Jummah prayer, consequently three Jummah prayers, three Jummahs, one after the other, then his heart will be sealed by Allah and he will be amongst the ghafileen. So this is the first warning. And the second warning is that Prophet himself, he is he's missing his own Jummah prayer. He is giving up his own Jummah prayer because attending the Jummah prayer is so serious that to make the people understand the importance of that, he is saying that I will let somebody give the Adhan for the Jummah, I will let somebody give the Khutbah for the Jummah, and I will let somebody to lead the prayer for the Jummah, but I will go out of the masjid and I'll burn the houses of those people who are not attending the Jummah. So, it is that serious. If we are under the age of puberty, if we are women, we are slaves, we are ill, or we are traveler, then it's okay. But if none of these four, five categories, if we don't fall into any of, any of these five categories, then we must attend the Jummah khutbah 
whatsoever it may be. Now, Sharia is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came back from UAE, Mashallah. Okay, now let's understand what are the genuine reasons. What are the genuine reasons by which a person can pray Zohar instead of attending the Juma prayer? Let me conclude what I have said. Some of you have come late. The first issue I have explained that there are certain people upon whom Juma is not compulsory. And they are children under the age of puberty, women, traveler, slave, Muslim slave, and the one who is ill. And the second issue I have explained is the punishment for those people who are deliberately, knowingly, intentionally not attending the Juma prayer. And they are the, the two warnings for them. One is that Prophet said that Allah will seal their heart and then they will be listed uh, in the list of the Ghafilin. And the second warning that Rasulullah said, I want to burn their houses because they are not attending the Juma prayer. The third issue is last issue of this khutbah and that is that what are the genuine reasons by which a person can give or live the Juma prayer. Imam Baghawi Rahmatullah in his book Kitab Sharh Sunnah he has given the detail of those people, uh, those reasons and he is saying the reasons due to which a person can meet Jamaat, congregational prayer, they are the same reasons for the Juma prayer. Because the congregational prayers, Fajr, Zohar, Asr, Maghrib and Isha, they are the prayers where people, Muslim men must pray in congregation and they have their some reasons not to pray. Those same reasons are applicable for the Juma because Juma is also a congregational prayer. Juma is also a congregational prayer. Congregational prayer means a, a prayer that is conducted by more than one people, more than one person. And what are those reasons? Number one, severe illness. If a person is serious and ill, seriously ill, then he, he, is, he, is not, he is exempted, he can pray at home the Zohar prayer. Number two, if it is severe cold, if a person comes to the masjid from leaving his house, he might die out of the frost, you know, the cold weather. Heavy rain, storm, war, life-threatening circumstances. These are some common reasons, but there are some general reasons. And you will find it very funny. But these are all based on the hadith. And if you know, if you want the notes, then it is very simple. Just email me, text me your email, text me your email. So I'll give you this khutbah uh, in the audio form. I'll send you the link as well as I'll send you the notes what, of what I'm saying today. Number one, the general reasons. Number one, if a person is holding something in his stomach, like he has to relieve, he is suffering from urination or he wants to relieve himself in the toilet and he is in desperate need of that and he is at the time where the Juma is going to be held. At that time Allah has given him the concession that he, that he must go and relieve himself even if he has to miss his Juma prayer. Because Rasulullah has said a person's ibadah cannot be accepted when he is holding his stomach and he is praying. So because the concentration in the prayer, concentration in the prayer is compulsory, is one of the pillars of the salah. One of the conditions of your salah to be valid, your prayer to be valid, and that is your mind should be, you know, diverting, you are concentrating to what you are saying. It's not like you are a taxi driver and you are standing and you said Allahu Akbar and you are with your accelerator, brake and a gear and your customers and your mind is elsewhere, your body is somewhere, your salah will not be accepted, rather it will be thrown on your face that this salah is thrown and rejected by Allah SWT. The same thing if a person is an IT expert, so when he says Allahu Akbar, 
he might be you know fixing the wires here and there might be you know fixing the network might be doing this computer software or that computer in his sala and that is very common because shaitan will make you remember the things of your own will especially at the time of sala so the pillar one of the pillars of the sala one of the conditions of the sala is the concentration and that's why rasul sallam has you know explained to us that this is allah's mercy that if a person has to go to the toilet and at the same time it is just the time for the prayer then he must go first relieve himself and then he can come and pray his prayer if he miss zohar if he miss juma no problem he can still pray zohar prayer so this is the first, one of the common reasons that if a person has to relieve himself in the toilet at the time of the prayer then he must go first relieve himself and then he can pray whatever he has you know catch with the uh, caught with the imam second reason hunger hunger and it is very simple the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has said that even there there's so many authentic ahadith and one of the common hadith is of abdullah bin umar abdullah bin umar radiyallahu an he attended the he visited his sister hafsa who is the daughter of umar prophet's wife and he heard the iqama in masjid an nabawi he heard the iqama for the prayer and the food was served he didn't go for the salah and he started eating and he said that rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that a person who has to relieve in the toilet or if a person is suffering from the uh, hunger and the food is served then he should finish his food first even if he has to you know miss his prayer but not in other way like you know that you are not feeling hungry but you don't want to go for the jama so you will say to your wife chalo serve the food that's different the the reason is hunger not the reason that you don't want to attend it the reason is hunger and because of that like you came from job you came you were busy totally you were busy you had some problem in the motorway and then you came you rushed to the house and you are tired oh exhausting and do so drowsy and hungry and all that and then you said to your wife serve the food and at the same time uncle bashir gave the iqama in the masjid hey your wife is saying jao namaz padhne jao no at that time when the food is served and you are hungry you should start with that food is that clear the third reason is a person is totally exhausted person is totally exhausted he is tired he feels sleepy and we know sometimes it happens a person is praying isha prayer in the masjid and he is snoring <laughs> i have seen i have seen people standing they are standing and they are gone <laughs> because the imam sahib is reading something so in that case it's not only that imam rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam was snoring while he was in the sajda in isha prayer there was a hadith where rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam he was <laughs> you know he fell asleep so this is this is all possible we are all human beings but islam is a religion of peace and mercy allah subhanahu wa ta'ala considers our you know natural behavior our capability and our capacity so based on that islam is a religion of mercy where it has got mercy upon us that if a person is drowsy a person feels tired he cannot pray he cannot concentrate because of his tiredness then rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam has given us this teaching that it is please come forward some brothers they find it difficult to come uh, find the place and it's not allowed in the juma to jump over the shoulders it is haram so when you come you should take the place in front and if you keep close you know sitting close to the imam you will get the close place to uh, in the jannah with rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam and if you want to keep away from this steady circle then you will be given the place in the jannah but you will be given the place behind the people so this is how the benefit is so when you come for the juma come closer inshallah this is how you are learning inshallah that we will learn in detail the manners of Uh, etiquette of a muslim while attending the juma prayer in the mosque that we will learn inshallah in our future khutbah so this is one of the issues which i wanted to make it clear to you that if a person is 
suffering from you know dizziness or something which is like he 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 cannot concentrate on the prayer because he is tired he wants to sleep he wants to take rest then alhamdulillah islam has given him the concession for that but again we have to understand today that suppose if your favorite game is cricket and you know that if you if you miss this match last match because you have to sleep then you took you take all the you know the precautions or you take all the uh, methods to keep you awake for that prayer uh, that uh, match but when it comes to the prayer you say oh abdul majid has said that you can you know take rest at the time of prayer and then you deliberately go back to your bed and you don't want to pray the prayer on time that's not permissible you have to keep yourself balanced you cannot play with allah's religion and if you don't want to pray allah is not in need of our prayers this is the first thing and not not we should not ever think we should not ever think that we are praying and we are doing favor upon allah we should not ever think that we are like you know there was a family in dubai they had some loss in the business they came to my house and they started complaining upon allah Mulvi sahab i am praying tahajjud but my business is not working why allah is not listening to me mulvi sahab i finished yaseen so many times i sat in the my in my office and reading yaseen i sat in my house and you know mulvi sahab told me that you read yaseen 12 times 12 times durood before the yaseen and 12 times durood after the yaseen your business will improve i am doing all these things but still allah is not you we should not say you know we should not mention the favors because allah does not need our prayers allah does not need our zakat and sadaqat allah has said in the quran la yanal allah luhumuha wala dimauha walakin yanalahu taqwa minkum allah is not when you are sacrificing the animal allah is clearly saying that when you sacrifice allah the animal for the sake of allah allah is not waiting for your mutton biryani la yanal allah luhumuha Allah ke paas jo tumhari biryani ke gosht nahi pahunchte Allah is not waiting for your mutton biryani when you are sacrificing la yana Allah luhumuha wa la dimauha and Allah is not waiting for the halwa the sweet that is made from the blood the quraish the meccans they used to make the halwa or sweet from the blood so Allah is saying Allah is not ask Allah is not waiting for your meat or Allah is not waiting for your sweet made from the blood what allah sees is your intention how sincerely you are sacrificing this god for allah for the sake of allah allah sees your sincerity and this is very clear so when we are praying it is the prayer that will help us to go to jannah and when we are fasting this fasting will help us to go to jannah when we are paying zakat this zakat will help us to go to jannah otherwise two head for pythons will be biting us saying i'm your hair wealth i'm your wealth you were holding it i'm your wealth so these are the things this is for us we while when we are performing mulvi sahab i have done 10 hajj <laughs> he's proud of his 10 hajj mulvi sahab every month every year i go four times to for umrah <laughs> he's proud of his good deeds no my brothers and sisters we have to make it very clear our ibadah is not required by allah Allah is not waiting for us. Hadith in Muslim Imam Ahmad Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, if the whole universe if the whole universe turn out to be disbelievers, still they cannot harm anything in Allah's domain. And if the whole universe become believers, still they cannot increase one thing in Allah's domain. So my brothers and sisters, it is very clear. The good that we do is for us. we are not adding anything to allah's personality and if we are doing evil we are doing evil to ourselves we are not harming allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even you know minor person so my brothers and sisters these are the issues which i wanted to make it very clear to you let me conclude what i said first issue is that there are people upon whom the juma is not compulsory and they are children under the age of puberty women slave traveler and a person who is ill rest everybody has to come for the juma the second issue is if you are not among those five people and still you miss 
the Juma prayer deliberately, intentionally, carelessly, then this is a warning for all of us. Where Rasulullah has said, if you miss, if you miss the Juma prayer deliberately, three Jumas, one after the other, your heart will be sealed by Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and you will be counted amongst the heedless people, ghafilin. And the second warning is that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, Rasulullah has said, who is a mercy to the Ummah, the whole nation. But he says that I want to burn the house of those, those people who are not attending the Juma prayer. And the third, third issue is that there are general reasons by which a person can miss Juma prayer and he can pray instead of that he can pray Zohar. He can pray Zohar. And that is cold, storm, rainy season, heavy rainy season or uh, if a person has got war or life threatening or person suffering from hunger, person suffering from physical illness or person is having, uh, you know, he wants to relieve himself from the toilet or X, Y, Z. So that way, these are the reasons, general reasons explained by Imam Bhagavad Rahmatullah in Sharh Sunnah that these are the reasons that can be applicable for the congregational prayers. The same reason can be applied for Juma prayer because Juma prayer is also a congregational prayer. Now the final point I want to make it clear to you in that case if you have missed the Juma prayer and you came to the like at this time like some of the brothers are coming now Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said when you entered the masjid and you have joined the Imam in the second rakat of Juma okay you entered the masjid you joined the Imam in the second rakat, Imam has already finished his first rakat of the Juma, and you have joined the Imam in the second rakat in the ruku. This is ruku. This is ruku. And the minimum pause in the ruku required is Subhana Rabbil Azim, Subhana Rabbil Azim, Subhana Rabbil Azim. So this is the minimum requirement of your ruku for your ruku to be valid. Ruku is one of the Pillars of his, uh, prayer. If your ruku is not valid, your rak rakat is not valid. So this is the minimum requirement of your ruku that you hold your knees with your hands, stretch your stretch knee, your backbone, and you say three times Subhana Rabbil Azim. So if you have joined the Imam in this ruku, in the second rakah of Imam, then Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying, you have attended the Juma prayer, you will get the full reward of the Juma prayer. Which means that when Imam finishes his second rakat, you already got him in the ruku. So when he says, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, you only have to pray one rakat of Juma. Because you have already achieved, you caught one rakat. And the hadith continues. Explained by Sheikh Nasuddin Albani in Irwal Ghalil. Where he says that the hadith continues, it says, If you join the Imam in the second rakah, after the ruku, then you have to pray four rakahs of Zohar. Because you will not get any reward for Juma prayer, because you have joined the Imam after the ruku. So based on this, the issue is very clear. If you join the Imam in the Juma prayer, in the second rakah, with the ruku of the imam, you get one rakat of juma. Then, once the imam has finished his salah, you have to just pray one more rakat, and your salah is valid. But if you have joined the imam after the ruku, your salah is not valid. Now, people, Salafi people, they make this issue that you didn't read the ruku, surah al-fatiha. How can you say your rakah is valid? This is the consensus of all the imams amongst the Sahaba also, that this situation is a situation where you didn't get the time to read Surah Al-Fatiha. You came in an emergency where you are in a situation where Prophet has told you to join the Imam in whatever the situation you find him. So you join him in the Ruku and Rasul Sallallahu is confirming that the people joining in the Ruku, the Salah is valid. So we don't have to contradict ourselves because the one who said your Salah is invalid without Fatiha the same person has said your salah is valid in the ruku because of the situation. Not because you don't want to read the Surah Al-Fatiha or because you don't read, you don't, you, have, you don't want to read it. No, it's not that case. You have the time and you don't read, then the problem comes. You have the time 
and then you don't read Surah Al-Fatiha, then your salah is hanging, whether accepted or not. And according to the hadith of Rasulullah Sallam, narrated by 200 Sahaba, 200 hadith, that salah without the Fatiha is invalid. But that is the situation where you have the time to read and you are not reading. But this is the second situation and again explained by Rasulullah Sallam as a mercy that you came to the masjid where the situation is that you joined the Imam in the Ruku. At that time, because you didn't get the time to read Surah Al-Fatiha, then your, you, this is a situation where Ruku is, you know, you are, your Salah is valid. And how to join the Imam in the Ruku? We come to the Masjid, Imam is in the Ruku. Imam is in the Ruku. In this case, when you want to join the Imam in the Ruku, you have to first say Allahu Akbar, give a call, it's not like Allah Akbar. No. Allah Akbar, and then you join Allah Akbar again. Your first Allah Akbar was for the starting of the prayer, and your second Allah Akbar was for joining the Imam. In that case, even if you said, Subhanahu Rabbi Amin, and Imam stood up, finish your Ruku is valid, inshallah. Am I clear? Am I clear? Alhamdulillah, but if you come like this, Allahu Akbar, and you just join like this, no, it will not be valid. Another hadith is Sahih Bukhari, a Sahabi, hadith is Sahih Bukhari, a Sahabi came to the masjid, and Rasul Sallallahu was in the ruku, Rasul Sallallahu was in the ruku, and the Sahabi was at the door of the masjid in Nabawi, and he said Allahu Akbar at the door, and he said Allahu Akbar, he joined it, same in the same place. And then he started doing it. And he joined the Jabbat. Alhamdulillah, the Salah was valid. So this is all in Sahih Bukhari. And so based on this, my brothers and sisters, the Salah is valid if you do this way. Alhamdulillah. And mashallah, because of my height and my personality, everybody will remember how Dr. Sheikh Safar said to us. So you'll remember this, inshallah. So we have completed the issue of upon whom the Juma is obligatory and upon whom it is not obligatory. I want to remind you again, if you want this khutbah and the link of this to hear it again and again, text me your email and also the khutbah which I have mentioned today, if you want the dalil with the references and all the quotations, I will send you the PDF copy of that. So if you just text me your email, inshallah, I will send you the link of last Juma and the notes of last Juma and today's khutbah and the notes of today's khutbah. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ala Muhammad kama sallaita ala Ibrahim wa ala ala Ibrahim wa ala Hamidu Majid Allahumma barik ala Muhammad wa ala ala Muhammad kama barakta ala Ibrahim wa ala ala Ibrahim wa ala Hamidu Majid wa aqim as-salah.